I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Normatech Recovery and Pogo Physio. I trust you've been having a great week, and I hope that you've been enjoying pursuing your physical best performance. Well, we made it. This is episode 100 of the Physical Performance Show. And as is so often in life, we can miss the opportunities to celebrate. So this is a little bit of a celebration episode where we do things a little differently. If this is your first time joining the Physical Performance Show and tuning in, then a massive welcome. What a way to uh, find the program on episode 100. If this is your 100th time, then a huge, huge thank you. This is really a special episode, less about the show and more about you, the faithful listener. Typically, it's at this point where I introduce the guest that we feature, whether that be an expert for an expert edition or whether that's a featured athlete or performer. It had been requested by numerous show followers that they would like to, for episode 100, hear a little bit about the backstory of the show itself and also what I've learned through conducting 100 interviews to date for this podcast and also what I've taken from working with some of these athletes and performers in my professional capacity as a physiotherapist. So we thought, all right, it's time for me to go behind the mic uh, and be ask some of the questions that I ask week in, week out. And as we would go full circle, we thought, let's get the physical performance show guest number one, Alistair Day, Nutrigrain Ironman champ and four times Coolangatta gold winner, Ali Day, in to ask some of the questions. And Ali is joined by Matt Morby, who is one of the team members here, much loved team members at Pogo Physio, who is a week in, week out listener of the podcast, who incidentally was a fan of the show even before his time in joining us at the practice in his employed capacity. We've got both Matt and Ali. So with that different introduction, let's jump in to explore a little bit about my backstory, the why of this podcast, what I've learned in bringing 100 episodes to air, the vision for the show, and some of the highlights and learnings along the way. And a quick side note, as an interesting twist in episode 100, as we were recording it, Alastair Day had a SADA Australian Sports Anti-Doping Agency representatives knock on the door here at the practice after hours to conduct standard drug testing. So we have done this over a couple of parts. We had a bit of a pause in the interview why Ali went and did his drug test. It took a little bit longer than uh, than he hoped uh, due to having to produce the urine sample. This was quite a bit of fun for the 100th episode, maybe a first in the podcast world, a drug test being conducted during an interview. Don't worry, the microphone didn't go with Ali to the bathroom. So let's jump in and have a bit of fun, episode 100. So, listeners, this is a uh, obviously a celebration episode, and it's very bizarre to be uh, behind the microphone as we record this. However, Matt Morby from Pogo Physio, who's uh, one of the faces that you'd often see around the Pogo uh, online presence, and also our guest from episode one, we <laughs> thought it'd be a nice way to bring in full circle has generously, one week after the 2017-2018 Nutrigrain Ironman Series title was hard fought out on the sands of uh, Cronulla Beach, Alistair Day has popped in for, uh, for, to join us tonight, which I think is a nice irony to bring it full circle from episode 1 to 100. 
So, uh, firstly, gents, thanks for coming along. And it feels weird to be the one being asked questions, but hopefully from some of the listeners' uh, requests, this can offer some value and insights and give a little bit of uh, direction into the why behind the what. Definitely, yeah. No, as I say, it's quite an interesting thing sitting here, you know, opposite Brad and then, you know, Ali to my right here. It's kind of quite surreal that, you know, you get to see the background to, to these two men. So it's certainly going to be an action-packed episode and I, uh, I can't wait for it. Well, thanks for coming, Matt. And Ali, uh, well fought out on the beach there. It was a, uh, you know, um, uh, to the last minute or two of the race of the final eliminator race yourself and previous guest Matt Bevilacqua fighting it out to the absolute uh, finish there and you know uh, you came out second in terms of the overall series you know it was a different year for how they did it but um, you know you showed a lot of character in, in, in how graciously you know you accepted the result but how's this last week been it's all still quite quite raw and fresh yeah, it is, mate, bringing it up then, and I think I mentioned before off air, I had a really good chat today, ironically, with Trev, Trev Hendy, which i um, been dying to, to catch up with uh, since last week, and just happened to be at a cafe that I was at today, and um, yeah, it was a, a bit of pill to swallow last Sunday, and every night when I fall asleep, I'm thinking about it when I'm on my own, when I'm driving the car, it's always in the back of my mind, but I'm a really big believer in that the universe has given me what I need and uh, I've definitely learned the lesson and as I was sort of saying to you before as well um, uh, it would have been really nice to get that recognition to, to win a, win another title um, I've won one before and it, it felt incredible but it would have been nice to win that again but as I said it's really nice to get the recognition from um, some of my peers and friends and family some of the messages I've had over the last couple of weeks or last week sorry been yeah been you know, so heartfelt and I'm um, just really lucky that I get to do what I do every day and um, the sun comes up tomorrow and now I look forward to racing in six weeks time over in Perth for the national titles. Well mate, you went about it so graciously and I think you win just as many fans if not more through how you handle, mm-hmm. handle yourself in those situations so uh, thanks for the thrilling finish and uh, uh, there is uh, more on the horizon for Ali Day, we all know that. So thanks for popping along tonight. Cheers mate. And uh, Ali, on the way in, you, you said to Matt and I, look, uh, you might get a knock on the door here at the practice. We're recording this after hours here at Pogo that uh, Asada, um, <laughs> you had updated your whereabouts, uh, the app, to let them know you were here, but they incidentally ended up at your family, at your home. And uh, Kel, your partner, just mentioned that yeah, they better come here. So we're, we're waiting for the drug testers to arrive. Yeah, we're about, it is very bizarre, isn't it? Uh, they turned up to my house. Kel, my beautiful partner, just rang me before we got on air here. Um, and they're on their way. I think it's almost nine. What, what is the time? Almost nine o'clock, 9.30. Yeah, five whatever. past nine. So it's, um, I make sure I always put my whereabouts late at night. So I, I know that I'm going to be home. Um, yeah, and once again, very bizarre that... And getting it done tonight and doing it at Pogo Physio, so that's that must surely that must be a first. Well, this will be a first, uh, the first live drug test. And I think it'll probably be the last as well. Do you want to take the microphone to the bathroom with you? Just to prove it's a true accurate uh, sample. Yeah. Well, it's clean sport. I love that actually, incidentally, about Ironman racing. It seems to be one of the sports that uh, has kept its purity, and there's almost like a there's almost that's the knockers now. Uh, that's there's that's almost so there's almost like a uh, a purity that exists in it where it's a a recognition of the other's efforts and not wanting to undermine that. I mean, maybe I'm naive, but that's from the outside. Oh, 100%. It's, uh, you know, everyone, every Iron Woman, Iron, Iron Man in, in our sport are incredible athletes, incredible human beings. And, and as you said, mate, they're, it's pure sport, clean sport, and um, you would never see any of them, you know, even thinking about that. And, um, yeah, once again, it's just an incredible sport that we get to be a part of. Yeah. It's time for your sample. I'll just go out there quickly. Oh, they're coming in. Oh, are they? <laughs> the first, first live drug test. First live drug test. We should take the microphone down at Ali. <laughs> You're listening to The Physical Performance Show, episode 100, with myself, Brad Beer, behind the microphone, being joined by Alastair Day, Iron Man Champ, episode one featured guest, and now also joining us on episode 100, and also Matt Morby, POGO team member. Support for today's show comes from 
Normatech. Normatech is the leader in rapid recovery systems designed to give a competitive edge to the world's elite endurance athletes. The Normatech Pulse Recovery Systems are dynamic compression devices designed for recovery and rehabilitation. Using its patented pulse technology to help athletes recover faster between workouts and after performance by reducing muscle soreness and improving circulation. It's simple. Get fresh legs faster with Normatech. To find out more about the Normatech recovery range, simply jump over to Alpha Sport. Dot com dot au, and there you can peruse all of the incredible Normatech recovery system products. Listeners of the Physical Performance Show can also pop in a promo code, capital P-O-G-O, POGO, to receive 5% off all Normatech products. Support for today's show also comes from a POGO Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to cross their physio finish line. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to cross their physio finish line. That's where we high five you and tell you that you've finished rehabilitation and celebrate the fact that you're back to your physical best. We do this through traditional session-to-session appointments, as well as some industry-first models of care, including our unique 2, 6, and 12-week fixed-fee unlimited access finish line programs, which include unlimited hands-on therapies and exercise rehabilitation, including clinical Pilates, and use of -of state-of-the-art equipment such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. In addition to these finish line programs, we also offer clients our very popular monthly wellness booster packages, which include remedial massage, physiotherapy, clinical Pilates, use of -of state-of-the-art technology such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill from an incredibly low $195 per month. To find out more about Pogo Physio's services, jump over to pogophysio.com.au and get back to your physical best. So that was a first for the physical performance show. A whole lot of fun. Uh, Ali, uh, you just had a SATA came and uh, to test you for uh, your normal standard in season testing. Uh, you're anticipating a quick turnaround on the samples, but uh, there was a little bit of delay. What was that about? Yeah, as, as you said, mate, very bizarre evening. It's pissing down rain outside, and I think they turned up at. 9.06, and it's now, what's the time now? It's almost, yeah, 5 past 11. <laughs> so that's the first time, I think, ever, I reckon, in the past eight or nine years I've been tested that it's taken me over two hours to go to the toilet. So you know, you normally have to get 90 mils, and I, I fell short. Um, I was about 60 or 70 mils. So I had to get a cup, I had to wait a good hour and go again, and I finally just got it. So, underperforming. <laughs> underperforming, mate. I wasn't performing at my physical best. <laughs> you needed a few more episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah. great to have you back in the cell. Oh, thanks, mate. And uh, it was quite fun to be, uh, to be part of it. So, good to see that uh, Asada are doing a great job and significant work. So, let's kick it off. So, Brad, we go back to the 12th of March, 2016, was day one when, you know, you released the physical performance show, and, and obviously with tonight having, you know, episode one's guest here, Ali Day, tell me, what was the inspiration behind it all those years ago? Yeah, it seems like a long time ago, and in some ways, that you know, they're like that saying, the days are long, the years are short, and really, it'll be almost two years at the time of our recording, where the start of March, and it was the 12th of March that Ali's episode was first released, so it feels like it's a short, short amount of time, but on the other hand, it feels like it's quite an extended amount of time, and I know you would have changed a lot in two years, Ali, you would have grown a lot yeah. in two years, and certainly well, I have, so the inspiration originally, Matt, was... Um, Twofold. One was that I reflected on my physio profession and really I spend all day, every day, conducting interviews. That's what you do to extract information out of the people that you see in a consult to make sure you can give them the best. Uh, and that's something that I reflect on. And as you mature in life, you better understand yourself. And I realise it's something that I've always enjoyed and um, 
into something that comes naturally. So the podcast was really an extension of that, uh, those day-to-day conversations. And I've often thought, wow, the conversations I get to have uh, on a day-to-day you know, basis, the information in that that people could take to apply to their own pursuit of their physical best and their own physical challenges um, is very rich. And so start to think about the best medium to maybe be able to access that and get that out. And then obviously that was several years ago and the idea probably sat in incubation for a good year as do many things before it actually started. So um, back then the podcasting world was quite green still and it was a whole lot of fun to jump in and just figure the journey out way back then. And the, the mission to inspire and educate people has never changed. How we have changed it has slightly morphed. How we have done it has slightly changed, but the mission remains pure, and that is to inspire and educate people to pursue their physical best performance. Yeah. So you think now, you know, obviously two years ago, did you ever think you'd get to episode 100? Obviously, you would like to have thought you'd keep going forever, but what was on you know, the 12th of March when the episode went live with Ali, what was your philosophy from there? Well, I think uh, Ali's looking at and at me and laughing, and I think we both <laughs> a long just, time ago. <laughs> we both probably recognise that if we start something, we want to see it through. And I know a lot of people start projects and do a few things, and then they never see it through. And it's like getting best performance, say in Ali's career. That's not going to happen in one season. That's going to happen over compounded season of uh, seasons of accrued effort. So, Matt, I had no doubt, no doubt, that we'd hit episode 100. I, what I didn't know was how we were going to get there. Uh, from the chaos of trying to figure out how to get it done through to um, initially through to then turning something in and out every week that's hopefully of a decent quality and the quality's improved on many fronts, not from the guest point of view but from how we've produced it and put it to air. And the only thing I'd say is it's been a team effort. It hasn't been myself. We've had incredible generous guests that have shared. We've had an incredibly talented team behind the scenes doing graphic design, amazing audio engineering. I mean, Daz who does this has worked with Tim Ferriss and some of the best in the audio space and then we've had you know some incredible administration uh, including recently your help and of course Susan Wilkin behind the scenes who is your favourite guest mate and why <laughs> <laughs> no I'm not going to ask you that I'm not going to I'm not going gonna, gonna, gonna to ask you that but I will say it, it, it's been you know to obviously to answer Brad's question me not being Brad but I thought when I sat there and filmed that that first episode with him when was it? 2016, I think yeah, you said, Matt. Yeah, 2016, yeah. I think we actually recorded it late 2015 and it took us a few months yeah. to figure out what to do with the file. I remember Brad saying to me, like, yeah, we're going to we're gonna be... Let's do a podcast. All the hours I spent here on the table with Brad giving me, you know, obviously the best treatment in the world um, with physio and then telling me about this, this, this podcast idea and he was like, come up and do it and we did it and, and now I look... I look at the, the people that are on there and I'm obviously probably the biggest fan of the show. <laughs> I'm like, man, I, do I even deserve to be on this <laughs> podcast? But as Brad, said, as Brad said before, the the things everyone can get out of the podcast are incredible. And, mate, I'd never ask you who's your favourite because I know that's me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that. In many ways, though, like... I, I really give the early guests a whole lot of credit because it was something that was unproven. You I don't think we knew like where it was. You didn't know that it would no. not see the, the light of day, pardon the no. pun, but you know you just trusted. And I think that's the beautiful part about who you are is that mm. you know, you've know got this great inherent trust in people. And so I do give the early guests credit because they gave up their time, as do all the guests, mm. so generously in busy schedules for something that was unproven. A bit different now, we're 100 episodes in and... You know, we've had some success with followership and ratings, and so you know, people know that people will tune in now. But back in the early days, mate, we had... I, I was wrapped. I remember when I saw the downloads for Ali's episode, and we hit 100. 100 people missed <laughs> that, that was me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was me ringing all my family in Kaima to, uh, to listen to yeah. <laughs> Did you get any feedback, interestingly, on the first episode? Uh, mate, I, I get feedback all the time, particularly from this one. I get, you know, like. The, the people that work here and you're just showing me the, the picture of the you know first week's guest but um obviously the you know all friends family supporters of me you know i always get pulled aside and they say hey you know we, we really got a lot out of that episode um and that's and that's ranging from from people that i compete against you know young kids older guys you know and i think that's really cool about it it just goes to show that um you can have a pretty big impact on someone 
you know, just by listening, you know, to 50 minutes or an hour of their bit of their story. And I feel really honored that I get the opportunity to do that. And I'd, I'd love to always say to you, Brad, I'd love to come back and I think I'd be better if I did, did another podcast with you. I think that was my first one that I've ever, ever you know, I've never done one before and I, I had no idea, I don't think either of us had any idea if I was going to work, but um, I'd love to give it a crack, maybe episode 200, you can get me back, or episode 101, who knows. Awesome, awesome. Because I can certainly say from, from my perspective, jumping in on that, I only sort of noticed Ali's probably when I was in training for a marathon and, and I've listened to it countless times, two, three, Jeez. four, and I'm not saying that because <laughs> he's right in front of me, but it's things like that that, you know, you give the inspiration to so many people, you know, mm. and that's episode one, you know, you, we're going back, you say, nearly two years yeah. and all your words in there are just something that yeah. will always strike home and I think that's something that probably Brad has learnt from day one that you know you've got to take those initial moments just you know hold them in your hand because oh, you just got to start exactly yeah you just yeah. got to start somewhere and that was the same as you know any successful person or anything that's yeah. that's turned into what it is today um and yeah i guess 2016 march <laughs> i remember the yeah. i remember that i think it was terrible weather like this as well and it started and here we are two years later and i think it's really cool for me and brad obviously that um you know, obviously, at the end of the day, we, it, it's just awesome to have a friend like that. You yeah. know, and, and it's cool to see someone, you know, having an impact. And exactly. I think that's really inspiring. Yeah, that's good to hear. Mm. In terms of Brad, for you, obviously, for for the listeners who don't know, the physical performance show is what Brad and I spoke about before being a chart topper. Um, especially in the health and fitness podcast, week in, week out, we're always seeing posts from Brad being in the top 50, top 20. Um, you've recently had some in you know, the top 10 right up there. So in terms of that, did you ever expect them to sort of reach your top levels like that? I mean, uh, yes and no, yes, because you don't ever start anything without wanting to put your best foot forward. But it was a completely unknown world. And so it was, you know, we didn't know where it was going to go. We just knew that we were going to stick with it until, um, until, yeah. <laughs> you know, until that inflection point came. And um, and so knowing that we had no idea how to even do it, um, and I guess yes, in that, you know, I knew that what the guests could share would hit home with people. It's just a matter of how does that get out there to get in people's earbuds. Mm. And every week we're still learning how, how, to, how to better do that. It's becoming a more saturated space now. So, you know, there's certainly, um, you know, challenges week to week in the best ways to do that. We've got the advent of so many platforms now on social media and, uh, you know, so it's a, it's a week to week challenge still. But I think the guest sharings are what makes it, you know, hopefully so transparent for people and of interest that they organically just want to absorb it, so... Yeah, definitely. Well, because I've got in front of me here, you know, the show purpose, you know, in, in your words or whoever typed this, the aim of the show is to educate and inspire listeners to pursue their physical best performance. Is that something you still... Obviously, you still stand by that now, but is that sort of the main philosophy behind it or have you sort of over the last, you know, 100 episodes... Have you started to develop a bit more of a, you know, understanding as to what you want to, you know, as you say, put into people's ears? Well, I think uh, as an example of how we've innovated and iterated, which is just normal process, we're sticking through, through things, no different to say Ali's strain. If we looked at, you know, how you've gone about your season, uh, factoring in recovery, and we spoke about this recently with mm. you as a maturing athlete, as we all mature every year, Matt, we have gotten different in how we've done it the vision the mission stayed the same that's been crystal clear from the get-go but um, that's never been up for grabs but what is up for grabs is how we do it so we've introduced expert editions in more recent mm. from i think episode 62 onwards with peter maliaris on how yeah. to best manage tendon injuries we've had bone experts uh running researchers uh knee surgeons we've got in the bag radiologists um, podiatrists and there's a whole scope of uh, different experts we want to pepper in about every 10th episode but then educating and inspiring you know they're two separate things but they're on the same coin and so you know each guest like way back to Ali's there was educational insights and uh, tips and practicalities that Ali shared around getting the best out of himself that speak to any pursuit physically but then there was also 
um, entertaining things that Ali shared. I remember a story about Ali and his brother in the, you know, in the swimming pool and racing each other. Um, and so each guest, there's a mix of that, guys. There's like Matt, there's a blend of that in- inspiration and also that education and then, of course, the, um, the entertaining as well. Yeah. Obviously, mate, I'm here to throw the curly ones. <laughs> curly ones at you. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start this one off, and I, I often ask you this. Who would you love to get on the podcast? <laughs> well, a good question, Ali. I have a document that is just consistent. <laughs> yeah, that's what you uploaded. And I could pull He's pulling up, the document up now. And you can just pick some of the names out of here randomly if you like, right. Ali. Some might already. Who's your here. number one though? Who, who, if you could have, you know, have have them in, in the practice one day for an hour or so, and just pick their brain on this, you know, who do you think I guess you could inspire and educate? Well, I know we've spoken a little bit about this, and I think you know who I'm going to share. But I mean, literally, you can take something from anyone, right? But mm. I mean, in terms of modern day athletic accomplishments, for me. Michael Phelps just, yeah. pardon the pun, but stands head and shoulders above mm. everyone. I mean, in terms of how do you reach that level of success in the first place, but then sustain it, you know, every Olympic cycle. Mm. Um, Have we got any strings there, mate? Well, there was a, out well, there. episode two, Jordan Harrison, who followed you, Ali, uh, Jordan spent some time in, in the uh, US in Phoenix training with Michael with Grant Hackett and uh, we actually said to Jordan before when he got back I said do you reckon you could hook up Michael for an episode this is before Rio Olympic Games and Jordan and I didn't want to hassle Jordan Harrison before he left because I'm like oh, I'm just going to throw a you know a commitment in for him that he doesn't yeah. want to have to deal with and on, when he got back, Jordan said, I wish you had to tell me that before I went. I maybe you could have organised it. <laughs> you so you'll be kicking yourself now. <laughs> That's so far right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, so anyway, Ali, I mean, I think well, you admire Michael. You, oh, you've read his course. coach's book. read his coach's book just recently. Um, read all his books as well. And definitely, I've got so many. Obviously, with him, he's done so much in that sport. Um, he took swimming to a whole other level. And... Yeah, wow, how do you go to that many Olympics, be consistent for that period of time? And then also, how does he, how do you handle the pressure of that? You know, how do you, how do you race eight different races at an Olympic Games and, and do, and you know, I think he broke seven world records at one of them and won eight gold medals. Like, it's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? It's hard to count as to how many, you know, you see those photos of him standing, you know, his arms out and the, and the medals just, uh, yeah, and stacked. you just wonder how over so many years he did it consistently year in year out you know you think you get to that one Olympics you say oh he's, he's done for yeah, yeah. and then he comes out and, and you know does seven or eight and you just go that's you know that's a true champion yeah 100% yeah and I think that's the question you want to ask is okay how do you hit peak performance but then how do you sustain it year on year out and yeah. we've had guests on the show so far who have been those enduring champions um, and I, I find that you know an absolutely perplexing algorithm of how they actually achieve that. I mean, then you talk about Kelly Slaters and, the, mm. you know, these athletes that have just stayed there. And how do they keep the drive, the desire? <laughs> it's yeah. crazy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Jumping off what, obviously, Ali's here, as he said, to throw in the curveballs. I've probably got more of the structured questions. That's just because I've got them written down I'm in front of me. Ali's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not here for good looks. Yeah. No, he's just here just to throw them in. <laughs> Brad, your book, You Can Run Pain-Free, you've obviously got in the beginning that you talk about someone who was probably what would be your, you know, your figure, your idol back in the day, Brad Bevan. Obviously, you had him on the physical performance show, I think, early, whether it's 10, 11 or 12 off the top of my head. Back in, obviously, you look back on that now, is that something that, you know, you look at being a highlight of the show? I mean, uh, you know, and Ali asked that in jest. I know the favourite guest on the show, literally it's impossible to, to pick one. Um, Brad was episode 15 and, uh, you know, you're right, Matt. I grew up, my first fallen in love with sport was was seeing Brad Bevan, you know, and Ali and I have spoken about this in the treatment room. We've watched the, uh, which we'll look up, link up in the show notes, the YouTube uh, video of Brad's career, which is, I find highly motivating. <laughs> but I remember watching Brad race domestically on the St. George, to his blue, had a few different iterations. 
televised triathlon series and I just thought I want to be that guy mm. and so uh, you know his name was Brad I thought that was pretty cool his surname <laughs> was B started with B and I thought that was pretty cool and all stars were aligning <laughs> and fortunately at school you know I had some degree of ability in endurance sports um, I wasn't a state champion or anything like that in primary school but I remember I used to always enjoy running distances and going out and I think then I caught wind of Steve Monaghetti um and watched his technique, and I used to run from my house as a kid, maybe 10 or 11, down to the river and back, which is 2Ks, and I'd try and run with my arms the same as Monaghetti, and I thought that was a characteristic of good runners. So Brad Bevan was my first true sporting love, and Matt, you're right, to have him on the podcast for us to feature Brad in episode 15 was a... Um, was definitely a pinch myself moment. I don't think I slept much the night before. And Brad hadn't done a lot of media. He didn't like it. It was not his nature. And so it all happened really quite by chance that I got the opportunity. And and uh, when Brad arrived, I'm like, all right, we're going to do this. And um, I recorded the episode. I think when he left, I think I just couldn't wipe the smile off my face and I checked the computer about 16 times to make sure it had saved and then the next thing I did is I messaged my mum and just told her what had happened because she lived with me having pictures on my wall and cardboard cutouts in our living room and you know hassling the hassling and the take me to races to watch him race live and all this stuff and she was like oh that's great that's great good on you and so it was quite nice yeah well I can certainly say being in the practice I've seen that video of, of Brad Bevan you've often pulled me aside of a of a day and I feel like Brad might be trying to get it up right now but uh he'll often be of a night time he'll pull me in before I go home and he's like oh Matt just quick quick watch this <laughs> and I'm always intrigued because Brad's always got some you know some cool videos or something and then he's you know probably got Brad's video just, you know, hyperlinked in the top, ready just to click on it. I think it's probably had, I don't know, 80,000 views, but I'm the large contributor. All right, mate. Well, with over the 100 guests that you've had on the podcast and all have been incredible, what are some of the biggest learnings that you've had, I guess, along the way? I guess some of the biggest takeaways that you could share with with me and Matty and share with all the listeners that that you've gotten out of you know, those 100, 100 or so episodes? Yeah, I mean, Ali, it's a great question. It's something I reflected on, thinking that that would be something of value for, you know, anyone tuning in. What are the consistent themes? And some people will have, you know, tuned into 100 episodes. Others will have done just a handful. But I guess um, it's come up regularly and one of the questions that, you know, gets asked is what's your number one piece of advice for people to pursue and perform at their physical best? You must, you must get asked that. All the time. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, and you know, and, and that's something we ask the guests, and they typically will say a few variations of the theme, but consistency comes up so often. Mm. And it just makes sense. Uh, you know, we've spoken about one of the guest sharings about, I think it might have been one of the runners, maybe Craig Mottram, about every session might have been Ryan Gregson. Ryan Gregson, Brian yeah, Gregson a fellow mate of yours, yeah. um, who shared around that every session is just a, a building block in the building. And and so consistency is definitely one of the key themes and characteristics of top performance. And I think everyone gets that. But then consistency isn't just turn up for a session. Consistency, I believe, is, you know, are you consistent with turning up for recovery, whether that's mm. treatment hands-on, whether that's using all the wonderful devices, Normatec boots, um, remedial massage, consistency in approach, uh, consistency in, in, you know, how you fuel yourself, consistency in all sorts of things. And it's not about being perfect, it's about being consistent. Mm-hmm. And there's a difference between, I think, consistency and frequency, and I think the best performers get that, that consistency matters, and it's just intuitive to them. They don't have to be taught or told, they just know that that's what's required. Mm-hmm. That'd be one thing. Uh, I've heard it quite a few times, Ali, through the guests, and that's the importance of just staying in your own lane, you know, not worrying about what's happening outside your own world. Just, you know, you can only do what you can do and you can't control other people's performance. That's come up a bit. And then also, I think one thing that stands out in the the peak performance is they just find ways to do things slightly differently. (laughs) In what way? Like... Well, you know, see, see if you can give us, an ex- not an example, but yeah, an example would be like we spoke about Brad Bevan. Yeah, and you just sat through this, and I know you didn't have any option because it's teaming down rain out there, and this would have been back in the '90s, and I know procedures have changed. But Brad Bevan, I remember shared a story about how he would, 
win one of the St George or two of his blue rounds. He'd be, you know, he'd have to get back to Mirawinnie in far north Cairns, but he had to get a drug test before he got back on the plane. He had to do a warm down. He was on a tight schedule to get to the airport and everything else. So he'd say, and he shares this on the episode, episode 15, hey, you're coming with me for a warm down run. And he'd have the drug testers run alongside him while he did a warm down run. <laughs> Whether they liked it or not, it's part of the deal. You want to hang out with me? That's what I'm doing. Come and we'll do it. And so, you know, I remember hearing that. Well, okay, those little things. I mean, Brad shared around riding through floodwaters in Mirawinnie when the town's sugarcane fields were just cut off. And, you know, and then, you know, even to someone like Nick Willis, who I know we've got a lot of mutual respect for, uh, multiple Olympic medalist, uh, still going, evergreen and into his 30s in a tough sport, 1,500-metre track running. You know, talking about that, one of those take-homes, it just really hit me between the eyes, and that is at elite levels, you get ahead when you rest. Mm. Everyone's doing the work on an Olympic final start line, but not everyone's disciplined or confident enough in their own game to do what's required to rest to get the most out of their body. It's when you rest, that's when you get ahead. And I remember going, oh my gosh, I've been around this world my own junior triathlon years and as a professional in terms of physio for decades and I never had thought of it in that term, those terms. I've never thought of it differently since then. And rest is something that comes up as one of the themes as well. I think all those 100, 100 guys that have been on the show... And I know from my personal experience, they're able to think outside the box just that little bit more, and they're able to be disciplined by it, commit to it, and they don't. It doesn't doesn't worry them or phase them that they're doing it that way. I know for me personally, there's some little, you know, little OCD habits that I have and use every day, and, and most people will be like, "Man, you're crazy for for doing that kind of stuff." But I know for a fact that all those top performing athletes have. You know, you know, it might be five or four or whatever one thing that they do daily, and as you said before, they do it consistently, and, and over time that just adds up, and that's when you get that desired goal at the end of the day. And I think that's that's really cool. Any examples of one of those little things that you do that's a bit, you know, oh, maybe quirky or? Man, I've got. I can't, I've got, I've got I can't remember the word you just used. It's a little. It's just the OCD. OCD I don't even know if that's what you call it, but. I mean, I, when I was young and growing up, I had a thing with if the coach would set 4.8 kilometres on the, you know, for, on the swimming board in the morning, if you wrote that on, I'd do five. I just had to do, I'd have to round it up to an even number. That was one thing. Um, I still kind of do that every now and then. Still, you know. um, oh, mate, you've caught me. I, there's so many little things that I'll... I just have to do just to make sure that I've left no stone unturned and I, I think that's a really big feeling it's a really good feeling you want to have when you turn up to a race or an event you want to know that you've left no stone unturned and um, that's something I will do till the cows come home because I think if you're doing that every day you turn up you're confident you believe in yourself and, and I mean it feels good you've done everything you can. And for the overseas listeners, to the cows come home uh, actually means to the end. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. How do you feel? I'm interested if you don't get uh, those little things done. Right or correct. Yeah, it, it, it can. If I don't get those little, you know, you, you know, little things right, um, yeah, it can disrupt my day. And that's something that I'm learning to sort of not stew over in my, the later years of, if, you know, the last couple of years with experience that. Not every. Well, I still, I still, I'm still a pretty big believer in all those little things do add up. They do count, but I'm slowly starting to see that not everything is, you know, detrimental to my performance. That it is okay to have a day off. It is okay to have to go a little bit easier every now and then. But I think that comes with age. It comes with experience. But I mean, mate, I could, I could sit here all night and tell you some of the things that I've done over the years. Um, to prepare me to, to race, you know, at, at my physical best. I remember, you know, I think I told you the story. My brother took me out when I was in year 11 and year 12 training for the the high school cross country and and running the hills down at, in Kaima, Saddleback Mountain. We just chose the worst day to go run it. And um, he said, look, let's just go up there. And it took takes an hour and a half or whatever to run it. And I wasn't a great runner throughout high school, but in year 11 and 12, I had a, a chance to sort of, I guess get a bit better at the sport of uh, cross country and I just he took me up there one day for a 90 minute two hour run it was 
a blizzard, you know what I mean? And I just did it. And I went, went and qualified, you know, went really, really well in the cross country. But that was because, you know, you turn up the line across country and nothing's that bad. But then that day he, he made me run it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's all those little things that I look back at my career and it makes me smile and because I know it's all worth it and, and it, it's, it's fun. That, that stuff toughens you up and I think it's good. And so I like as a maxim that I always think of, and that's a shortcut will only cut you short. And I and I love that. That's you know you don't get peak performance by not doing the 400 warm down by doing 250 meters. It's yeah, like yeah. finishing races. I know in my junior years I never conceived the idea of no matter how bad the race of not finishing the event because I'm a big. It sets a precedent that yeah. okay that's just, I can pull out of races now yeah. when it's not going my way. And so I think what you just shared there, Ali, like in terms of you know your approach is consistent across all peak performers yeah. and that's you know there's no shortcuts here yeah. if it says a 1k effort it's a 1k effort yeah um, i just feel I'll, honestly <laughs> i'll go home guilty at night not knowing that i couldn't i could have done more or you know i could have done this i could have done that i honestly sometimes go home and dwell on it that i could have done a little bit better here there or anywhere and yeah sometimes it, it keeps me up at night but <laughs> it's shaped me to who i am today and i think it's great Ali, going back to what you're saying, obviously about the things, you know, we, we talk about here at Pogo, the 1% is matter, you know, and as you say, all of those add up to a point where they do matter in the end. Is there any other things that you used to do as a younger kid that you still carry through to today that just to sort of, you know, bring you back to your childhood a bit? Oh, that's a really good question, mate. There's so many, and I wish I had of Kel would know, my partner would know some of the things that I do. Um, the, the past five years have been, you know, living with her, and she probably sees it very up close. The things I, you know, used to do, but oh, yeah, put me on. I'm probably throwing you. No, no, <laughs> I really, you know, I've got so many little things that I've, you know, used to do, and um, obviously a big one for me when I was growing up on the south coast was training on my own. I used to put the Rocky DVDs on, um, <laughs> particularly the one where he goes and fights Ivan Drago in Russia, and. You know, I get like tears coming down my eyes. You know, watching that final, that that montage scene mm-hmm. and fighting, and I, you know, looked at it and I felt like I was Rocky because I was this kid that wasn't that very talented, and you know, I wasn't having that much success in the sports. I, I just really, I'd, I'd watch those movies and just go and train and, and just, just try to be tough, try to be like Brad Bevan, the, the videos Brad would show me of him running in the snow and things like that. So I'd go do things like that, and I still pride myself on. The little things, as you said, the one percent is I, I make sure I don't miss laps. I'll never, yeah. never do that. You'll never catch me doing that. You'll never catch me pulling on a lane or up your back straight. It's yeah. just a thing I'll never do. Um, I'll always put my best foot forward, always give a hundred percent. Um, you know, in terms of the recovery, I'm always making sure I'm in here seeing Brad. Um, that's just a no brainer, just so I can continue to you know do the best same with my diet the past four or five years it's been rock solid you know it's you know I spend a lot of money and I put a lot of time and effort into that I'm continuously learning from other athletes other books listening to Brad's podcast I'm a huge fan of Conor McGregor at the moment I just see the attention to detail that he goes to um, to get the best out of himself and and ultimately, at the end of the day, that's all I'm trying to do. I, I, I want to hang the togs up or hang the paddle up or whatever you want to call it in however many years and know that, yeah, I said that analogy before, left no stone unturned, unturned, un, unturned sorry, unturned. Um, and, yeah, because I'll get that sick, guilty feeling that, no, yeah. I didn't didn't do everything I can yeah. well, while I had the chance. And, yeah, I guess there's so many little, so many of those little things I've done over time, but... Yeah, those one percenters. I think um, uh, you know. I think I do better than than most, and I really pride myself on doing that. Yeah. Well, as you say, as someone you know, and Brad and I would probably agree on this. Someone who watches you, you know, race, you know, perform, you can certainly see it. You know, you're a, you're a humble champion, and you know, you listen to interviews, and and as you say, those little things all add up, and eventually they all come out as being. You know, it shows the hard work that you do mm. put in. Cheers, mate. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So switching back to Brad now in terms of the podcast and giving us sort of we've heard a bit of a background on, you know, Ali's performance and what makes him, you know, perform at his physical best. 
what are the mechanics behind shaping an episode? Because for the viewers and the listeners, they just hear a one hour, one and a half hour, you know, uncut, oh, sorry, edited, sorry, right from start to finish. And it just sounds, you know, effortless. You know, obviously you've got all your background stuff, but what is it, you know, obviously give us a quick rundown start to finish of how it sort of all comes about. Yeah, the mechanics. So, I mean, uh, Ali just saw the the uh, document we use for guest order and list. So, you know, it starts with approaching a prospective guest and sometimes the incubation period can be a few months, like Ali and I chatted for months before we made episode one happen. Um, I've had, uh, we've had, I should say, guests, in- the incubation period be someone recently and I thought, wow, that took a whole year to get done, but it was worth it. Um, and so I know that in time there'll be years of incubation. So it starts with obviously reaching out to someone um, or trying to make contact, scheduling it. That can be challenging. That's just, you know, step two, let's schedule it. If it's remote, it's done digitally via Skype. If it's in person, I always like that. It's quite intimate and you just get a sense. You can read body language. And I think you can pick that up in audio into some ways um, when people are face to face. Once we record the interview, it goes. The file goes uh, via Dropbox to our audio engineer Daryl Misson, and Daryl um, then goes through and does his audio magic, where he, you know, exports split tracks and he overlays it to try and optimize the audio. Um, we've had audio challenges over the time. I mean, even in recent episodes, you know, Lionel Sanders as an example was a guest. So I was really excited. Ali and I both. Both, uh, I think, fell in love with Lionel in 2017 at the Hawaii Ironman Champs and his valiant effort there, um, valiant effort. But, um, you know, Skype had upgraded itself and in doing so it flicked the default mic setting back to the computer instead of the mic that we use. And so it had this sort of, no one would have heard of it, but, you know, heard it necessarily, but I picked it up. It was this tinny sound. I'm like, oh, I was devastated. Um, so, you know, we've got to get the file produced. Uh, intros and outros are always recorded after the intro, after the actual recording of the guest. And that is actually the most laborious process because, yes, there's scripts to follow, but then the pressure I feel each week is trying to honour the bio of each guest. So whether that's an athlete or an expert edition trying to, give the credibility that they're, they're due and that's I feel some inherent pressure if they've been to four Olympic games I don't want to say they've been to three if they if they want a medal I don't want to miss that and so I put a lot of time into trying to get that right and I'll be here typically on a Monday evening quite late just re re redoing it until that's right um, and then from there you know it goes up to the platforms that it lives in and then it goes live typically on a Thursday night and I think bar one or two occasions has been consistently every week um, which is just one of those fruits of consistency. And um, and then we've got to get the word out about it. So we're still getting better at doing that. Social media is great. Uh, it's, it's amazing and it's never expected, but it's always appreciated when guests often will share it on their social media. I know Ali didn't appreciate that. Um, that brings a new set of earbuds or eyeballs to visibility of the show. So there's a whole lot to it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's, a, it's a big project, but it's a passion project. And I've never sat and counted up how many hours each week go, go into it collectively, um, but there's quite a bit. And then you've got researching for the guests. And so that can start weeks in advance where I'll go and look for audios or YouTube clips and I'll read and we'll print out things and we'll come up with a shape of epic questions. And, you know, we want to try and do a few things well and that's to get the key insights and interesting stories out of the guest and you know we're not a gotcha show so we're not into scandals um some people have said look with that guest you should ask him about that i'm like well you know this is not a gotcha show this is not you know a newspaper this is just trying to get those key performance principles out yeah and i uh, going back to what you're saying before about the uh, the intros and outros for all the the viewers listening at home it's actually quite funny i was sitting in here just uh watching brad do it then if i can try and put a, a mental image into your head i just had brad standing against the desk with a uh, with a towel over his head which sort of uh correct me if i'm wrong but sort of you know cuts out a bit of the echo from from the room and and you can certainly see how many times it actually takes him to to get it right you know you can hear the ah oh, damn it. you know i nearly got it but it's actually quite funny because you know as you say you listen to the episodes and it's just faultless it's effortless but you know you could spend you know i think when ali was was out in the bathroom you know you probably spend half an hour 45 minutes just trying to just trying to nail it and as you say you, you want to try and honor that 
for for the guests. And part of that towel is that you know it is an investment that needs to be made in equipment, and we've tried to steward that over time. And so we've just ordered a new thing that helps go around the mic to cut out the need to put a towel over my head. But Daryl, our <laughs> our audio engineer, you know, has coached me from the get go. I have no idea about audio, and most people don't when they start in this format. But there's an art to it. I mean, someone like Daryl spent his whole career in in audio producing he knows the game and he's coached us through how to get the best out of it and I remember and there's been some horrendous audio quality on this podcast so far but there's been some really good ones as well we're still 100 episodes in talk about learning trying to figure out how to get the best out of it consistently each week one of the challenges we don't have a recording studio we're yeah. sitting in my consult room here at the practice yeah um, and so you know it's uh, it's you know it's, it's quite funny to think about yeah and touching on sponsorships because you said to me before that you know you wanted to have a sponsorship by episode 100 and you, you know you've just recently taken on Norma Tech as being one do you sort of see you know obviously bigger ones coming into the future or what's your you know your ideology behind that yeah I mean and, and I like to think of them as partners but to, you know we can call it a sponsorship sort of in, in essence but it was more about we would look for that after 100 episodes. So, incidentally, Normatec came on um, at around about episode, I think, 90 or 92. And so it was, you know, like, okay, we're almost at 100. But we, this show is not about commercialising it. it. It doesn't generate revenue per se. Um, it does give us a platform to get messaging out there and ensure it's got Pogo attached to it as well. But, um, you know, even now, like, say, a Normatec recovery whose support we're highly appreciative of, it just goes part way to covering the costs of outputting an episode. And, you know, by the time we have the different people contribute to all the work on it, we're talking about hundreds of dollars per episode to go live. Um, and so really, as I've been saying lately, podcasts are free to download, but they're not free to produce if we want to keep raising the bar and how we do it, then um, we've, you know, it's, it's, it's necessary for the lifeblood of it that we get people to help partner with us. So, you know, we've had Normatec recently. We shortly will throw to Gold Coast Marathon, supporting some episodes leading into the Gold Coast Marathon in July. And, and then it's been fun recently to, some, you know, a couple of national and uh, one international brand who have approached to say, we love what you're doing and, you know, can we be part of it? So, um, so Matt commercialization is a, just a reality of trying to do things well over time so yeah, yeah. but it's exciting I, I, I love you know having people and brands like that come to us and say hey this is great quality can we be part of it yeah and it's certainly cool to see from from my perspective um for the viewers i'm obviously here monday to friday on on a lot of admin duties and brad will often come and share with us you know when we've got new partners coming along because it obviously you know it makes brad's day so you know it's obviously quite a big thing but it's it's really cool to sort of see you know in the eight nine months that i've been here how much this show has grown and how much you know you've grown in terms of interviewing and and quality and everything so it's really cool to see you know as i say in the short period of time that i've been here and i know ellie's obviously got a couple of years on me and that but um but no as i say it's it's certainly something to watch for the future and I hope listeners you know get the concept that you know there's costs associated so we, we, we you know we're trying to keep it uh, not too far in the in the red um, <laughs> and I mean if you added up the cost which I did quickly having a shower the other day I thought okay you know there's a, there's a significant there's a significant investment that we've spent for right from episode one to do it well um, and you know we'll be in the red for quite a while but it's more about covering costs and, and allowing this to continue to get out there week in week out well you do it for the love of it you know as you say you love producing these you can pay me enough to do this i mean it's yeah. uh you know pinch yourself stuff steve monaghetti robert de costello i mean you know um you know bernard legat some of the if you had a told brad bevan you know as a kid that i'd get the opportunity to do this this is the stuff dreams are made of yeah and exactly so, mate, yeah. It's, it is a lot of fun yeah so, so mate take us take me maddie all the listeners back to the start before you know before the podcast tell us how you got into physio yeah ali um i know you're a huge and, you know, huge fan of sport, probably bigger than me, which is, which is big. <laughs> you know what? I, I disagree with that because I, I often see things about performance and getting the best. And I say I live in the intersection of two things. 
optimizing physical performance and pursuing people's best potential. And so um, when I see something, I often think, I know someone that would appreciate this, it'd be Ali. Mm. Even if it was uh, last night watching the 60 Minutes big <laughs> wave story at Nazare, Portugal, Ross Clark Jones and Mitch, uh, whose name surname I can't eludes me at the moment but these guys take on you know 60 80 foot waves i'm like i know who would be just absolutely uh, <laughs> eyeballs hanging out of his head it's ali so i flicked ali a message hey check this out yeah. um and so and that's, that's not a regular occurrence too. It's funny. <laughs> so um so you know yeah, take us back to the to the why and 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 obviously you still love it so much now because it's 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 open this door, the podcast and everything behind it. Do you still love it? What's the... What's the... Well, I find now, Ali, it's... My physio was a natural. I only have had two career paths, triathlon or physio. And <laughs> I set about trying to be Brad Bevan right from the age of 11 when I discovered triathlon through to 20 where I had a big bike crash at 19 mm-hmm. and some serious injuries there, um, which only in years later you actually look back and actually appreciate... You know, that was serious. I had a brain hemorrhage from the bike crash. I was in you know, a neuro ward in um, the uh, Children's Hospital in Sydney, West, uh, the Pean Hospital, and then Westmead, broken bones. And I thought it was a big joke because I was 19 and bulletproof. And I thought it was funny when people came around to ask about, you know, who's the prime minister of the country? And I'm like, well, it's John Howard. That's hilarious. <laughs> but what they were testing for is how much retrograde amnesia I had, and which is a byproduct of, you know, brain, brain trauma. And so, uh, so physio was a natural progression when my sort of aspiring and it was an aspiration, it was a possibility as well that I could have gone into that pathway. But, you know, when that sort of came to a grinding halt at 19, um, I thought, what's next? And I moved to the Gold Coast. I had a year out really just to get my skin wounds. That was back when you wore DTs and singlets in triathlon. <laughs> And you, should bring that and you back. thought nothing of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tim Reid does, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And uh, budgie smugglers. And so uh, that took uh, a year to try and get my body even in a state where I could do things. I moved to the Gold Coast, started training a squad that was with Bill Daverin and was training Craig Walton for the first Olympic triathlon in 2000. Um, and I just couldn't do the sessions. I was in too much pain with my knee. And so at that point, I was starting uni and that was an exercise science degree and back when I was 16 I used to travel from Grafton to Ballina um, which is about an hour and a half drive because my running coach wanted me to see this physio who was Mm. really skilled and her name was Suzanne Bray and I'd look forward to going and seeing the physio it was pretty much weekly I had a litany of things as a junior athlete tendons shin bones you know all the stuff that you get growing that we all go through why you ended up being a great physio well I did have most of the injuries and Suzanne once said to me you know what I think she was doing something and she said you'd make a great physio one day and I look back and I think the power of words and encouraging kids in the youth which I know Ali in your career you've always got time for kids and I think that speaks volumes into their potential um but the power of words, I mean, Suzanne said you make a great physio, and I remember going, park that thought, if triathlon doesn't work out, then that's what I'll do. And so that's what I you know, took on and uh, finished uni and pretty much pretty quickly opened the practice. Yeah. So it's been my life for 12 years now, and, and it's never ceased to thrill me. Yeah. And I know there must be some stories there. Obviously, we're here recording this at almost 10 to 12, which is... <laughs> I keep using this. This is the latest you've ever been up. It's a bizarre one. It's the latest. There must be some stories that you can, you know, I was was talking to you before about some of the things that I did training wise, and and everyone's got a story. There must be some stories back in the day when you just got the practice up and going where you had to pull an all nighter or, you know, you just just had to make ends meet to, to make this thing work. Can you? think of a story or a moment or you look back on a memory and go how did I even get through that time or or you look back and laugh and go man how much did that help shape me to the person I am today you know I think we've spoken about this Ali obviously mm. you recently found an active gym on the Gold Coast it's a great facility check it out online guys but um, one of the best character development exercises I think anyone can do in life is to own or found some commercial enterprise, be it a business or a charity or whatever it might be, but you learn so much about yourself, as you say, and if you had told me when I left uni and worked in a dream job with an Olympic physio that 
I left fairly quickly, not because of that. It's the partnership they had was a bit clunky and toxic and really one of the things that was lacking is a vision I was I came in ready to do whatever it took to be a great physio mm -hmm. uh, in private practice and quickly felt like I ran out of juice without an occasional tap on the back and a bit of a vision hey Brad if you keep going this is what's in front of you and so I got disillusioned very quickly I remember my wife Christina saying what's wrong like we weren't yet married actually we were uh, engaged what's wrong you, you know you seem pretty sullen I'm like oh I can't believe this is what I, this is what I thought I've always wanted to do, and now I'm doing it. I'm just not not wrapped with it, and so that's when the idea came in to start the practice. And so off I went, gave notice, went home, and you know figured out how we're going to open practice. And it was just raw as, and I think it's like anything you you start. If you knew what was involved, you maybe would sit and think a bit longer on starting it. But you know the thrill of the joy from learning and figuring out how to do it and the satisfaction of seeing it come to fruition and is is is, is great and i think sports like that and that's one of the reasons i love the pursuit of people's physical journey whether that's trying to win neutral grain series titles or cooling out of golds or whether it's trying to be matt at 19 running the new york marathon um or me trying to run my best marathon time the commonality is we're trying to do our best and to get there, it's only going to happen through hardship and learning from it. And, mm. and specifically to answer your question, you know, the practice, gosh, um, the first client, we called the practice My Back's Physio and she had calf pain. And, and I had signed up to a lease for the practice in Surface Paradise on the second store with no access via, unless you went via stairs or this old car park. <laughs> Who puts a physio practice two stories up with stairs? Um, and I'd signed a lease with no rent-free period. I had no idea what that even meant, and so which meant from the day one we had to pay rent. And I had, um, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. I was a decent physio, but I didn't even figure out the software system until the lady was paying, and it happened to be the bookkeeper of the business who had the calf strain. And so we had my back's physio on the walls, and I'm like, hey, Danielle, I can help your calf. Um, and I could, and I wanted to, but the vision was blurred. We were no longer a practice focused on backs. We were practice. <laughs> and uh, I think it took me longer, Ali, to process her payment than it did for me to administer her treatment. <laughs> and she was very gracious about that. And then, you know, just, oh, gosh, the, the practice, the, the amount of, you know, highlights and extreme lowlights. I mean, I've spoke openly about we had a, a journey of four years in a nat five years nearly in a national group that wasn't what, I thought it might be and there was low lights in that when mm. I was clinically depressed with the hardships walked out the back here one night not even caring if the building was locked I'd normally double check it like you know your OCDs you care about it so you take extra measures it's like I don't even care if that place gets broken into mm. and I was turning up like a just a skeleton still giving my best because I had people re relying on me and it yeah, was a responsibility yeah. but I was like devoid of vision devoid of passion um, and so, you know, that's an example of, I guess, you know, the highlights, the lowlights mm. of the business life. How much do you reflect um, back on those times? And do you walk in here every day and look at, you know, the blue pogo sign and, and it's, it's buzzing every day, every time I'm in here, there's so many different walks of life, people doing Pilates, people using the normal tech booth, someone using the Alter G. So you've created an amazing atmosphere here. Do you often look back? and think, wow, I've created this? Or are you always just thinking ahead to the, you know, what's next, what, how can I make this better? It's a great question. I think the background, the, the early days, it always gives context to the contemporary experience. And so, yeah, I mean, it's that double, that sort of, you know, permanent discontent that you live in, which is always more, mm. you know, and people often, you know, it's great to hear, they praise the practice, like, and I appreciate that, Ali. It's, but I can see so much more. Yeah. And if I had to rate us out of 10, I'm going to rate us like a five. Mm. Hey, we're doing good, but geez, there's a lot more we can do better. Mm. And I think if you ever lose that that sense of there's more, then it's probably good lights out. Yeah. You know, yeah. go to do something else. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm always thankful for the past and it's great to look at the times when things weren't how they are now, but um, mm. there's also that excitement that we can keep getting better. Oh, of course. Of course. And I love the, what you said about the place feels like it's buzzing. To me, that's a successful practice. The when the building's well, full, it? there's people laughing in the active rehab areas, there's people recovering, there's people... I love that. And I've yeah. never lost that, that joy. It's like, wow, this is doing what it was designed to do. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen you walk out and, and grab me to come into the room 
you know, without some sort of energy and, and uh, it's contagious because from the guys at the front desk, and I know I'm not just, you know, blabbering on here because um, obviously Pogo are huge supporters of mine, but everyone from the, from the, from the top to the bottom and everything in between, um, you just coached and trained them and just bring that community feel and it's something that I'm, that I'm really passionate about with, with my gym out at Active and it's hard to do and um, I'm sure Matty would agree it's a pretty awesome spot to work and mm-hmm. it's, a, it's an amazing spot to come into every day and I know for me personally I've had some, some really really amazing times here but I've also had some times where I've you know had the bad news of you know stress fractures and things that you've managed me through Brad and um you still walk out of here with a smile on your face, which I think is, at the end of the day, the most important thing. I think professionally, Ali, it's interesting you say that because we deal with that day in, day out, whether it's, you know, in, in Matt, your capacity at the front of the practice or in a treatment room, mm. people are walking out with, you know, at times disappointing, mm. you know, at times devastating, you know, well, you know uh, diagnosis and different things. and. Uh, I always say our work involves the hands and the mouth and so the power in words and to encourage people and to give them a vision and to give them a hope that things will be okay. It's, you know, it's a great responsibility, but it's such a joy. Oh. And I think environment dictates performance. So you say it feels good when you walk in. Well, yeah, we're intentional about that, but that's a principle that transcends mm. you know, the guests on the show. They don't surround themselves in environments that don't allow them to mm. perform at their best. Mm. That's a, such a big feature of, of peak performance. Well, it's funny because... It's not, it's not funny, but one of the, the biggest... I think it's a really cool story. Um, the Saturday, the week leading into the cool and get a gold... Um, I've literally, I was too easy, I think it was. Because there's been something almost every year. <laughs> um, but that year, tweaked my calf going into that race. And I remember sitting there with my coach saying, you know, we rang Brad. Brad said, come into the clinic, I'll have a look at it. Um, he had a look at it. We iced it all weekend. I, I couldn't walk on it. The calf was was pretty stuffed. I came here on Monday. I think I, I, think I might have had the scan Monday afternoon. And not many people knew about it. However, I said, Q scan did it for me. And he, I think Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, he left me a voice message that morning um, saying the news wasn't that good. Uh, so I came in here with my head really down and and Brad picked it up straight away and said, um, you know, whatever it is, we're going to just deal with the best way we know how to and we're just going to do everything we can from Tuesday to Sunday morning when the race is on. I think I spent probably the record record time in here that week. <laughs> Brad, I was in here twice a day. I was in here twi- oh, yeah, almost twice a day for a few hours. Of, you know, a few through you know three up to three hours a day. I was in here. I remember running along the hallways here on Saturday afternoon, going, Brad, am I you know am I going to be alright? And I, I just think it's a really cool story that I almost get a bit emotional saying that I had someone in my corner um, saying we'll do everything we can to get you to the start line and um, ended up doing the race you know you know 500 meters from the finish saw Brad Brad ran with me yeah. couldn't keep up with him um, <laughs> <laughs> but just one of those things and um, you know I know Brad's probably embarrassed me saying saying all this but just the story of, of hardship and and we got to do that together and um just a cool story. I thought I'd just add, add that in there yeah. anyway because, you know, I think a lot of people can, can get something out of that as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, so I've Being here only eight, nine months, you know, I've sort of been, you know, not necessarily in your corner as much as probably Brad has, but, you know, before Ali sees Brad, you know, I'm the one who, who you know, schedules the appointment, you know, makes sure times work with him. And, you must and, be sick of your ring. <laughs> I've always got Ali on the <laughs> phone. Hey, Matty, can I... <laughs> playing phone tag all day long but how is it that you know obviously as you say brad was one of those guys that was in your corner you know you look back on your last two three years probably as you've been you know your most successful what was the most underlying moment that you knew you would always have the support of brad like was there a you know i want to call it a light bulb moment but it's probably not but something where it was a snap of the fingers where you said to yourself i've got brad and i've got pogo for yeah. you know forever really it's an awesome it's an awesome question it's it's something that i literally yeah think about all the time to be honest um zane hamill my coach at surface is 
you know, his, his best mates and grew up with Brad. Um, and I often think that, you know, when I moved down here to the Gold Coast, if I didn't move to Surface Paradise, I wouldn't have met Brad. And I think Brad's heard me say that to him before. Um, but in terms of a light bulb moment, um, I think the first afternoon I came in here on that Saturday afternoon, I just, I'd, I'd seen so many physios over my time, obviously. I'm like Brad, I've had, you know, probably not as bad as you as Brad, <laughs> but I've had my fair share as well, so I've seen plenty of physios and, and things like that. But I just felt really comfortable from that day, Dodd. And, and obviously those stories, you know, the stress fractures and, you know, the, obviously that calf strain, that afternoon on Saturday afternoon but that, that, that Tuesday morning I came in here on that Monday morning whatever it was seeing Brad like that I mean he looked after me the last you know this is the third year now and obviously those those Kellogg's Nutri-Grain races I think you know another great story is I, I, last year at the, the Ironman series it was a three day event um, Brad was obviously down there looking after me and, and Shannon Eckstein and um, I won that day and unfortunately Shannon, um, you know, injured himself pretty badly and Brad was at the hospital with him. Brad was messaging me, going, oh, mate, you're all right, you're okay, mate, I'm fine. Like, I've just, just worried about Shannon and, um, you know, to his, to, to, to Brad, he, he rang me, he says, no, nah, I've, I've got to come see you, I want to see you, I want to, you know, wish you all the best for again for tomorrow and I want to get this work done now and, um, that was at 9.30 at night after him being at the hospital I knew he wouldn't have eaten all day either yeah. <laughs> it was terrible weather too which Brad would remember as well it was freezing but he came into my hotel room at, at Ridges at Cronulla at, you know that time and, and that's just a continuous thing that's um, yeah, it's grown a lot more beyond just being physio you yeah. know our friendship and, and relationship it's I don't really see him as sort of doing that for me anymore yeah I, I come in here I feel like feel a million bucks and I walk out the door but I feel like I'm just talking to my mate for 45 minutes or an hour and then we and I leave and then you leave <laughs> yeah exactly yeah you know, and, then, and then he leaves me messages so I know that's a, a long winded you know a long winded answer but man there's so many so many times along the way that I go geez I'm, I'm so lucky that um yeah one of my my biggest sponsors is Pogo Physio and mm. um you know hopefully you know, I continue can continue so to return the favour and, and do well in races, be the person I can be, and and um, hopefully I can, Brad can, which he will, he'll keep me together for a, a lot, you know, a long, long, you know, hopefully a few more years, hopefully a lot, lot longer, and um, you know, we can continue the journey together. Yeah, mm. and and hearing that, Brad, you know, I remember you said to me one day when I think you've had Brad Bevan in for for physio at some stage or you've had those you know athletes that have come in and you know you've always said it's an honor for you you know you always say about Shannon and about Ellie it's an honor for you to actually have them in the practice you know and hearing that you know from Ellie now how does that sort of you know you look back on your last you know 10 12 years of being a physio you know does that obviously that would make you smile every day when you get up to know that you've got you know people like Ellie who just have your you know, who honestly have your ultimate support? Well, Mabs, I mean, it's it's the thrill of the chase, and the thrill of the chase is okay. You know, Ali's story. It's it's one of you know, uh, s- you know, several stories that you know I often draw on when I'm trying to encourage someone that okay, this has happened, but there's still hope that you know you can get out what you're trying to get out physically. <laughs> and, and people might go, well, it's just a performance, it's just an event, but. Uh, when you're wired to enjoy performance physically, like it's 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 part of who you are. So, so you know, it is it is a the thrill of the chase, and whether that's at the pointy end of town, like Ali, as you mentioned, Matt, or whether that's you know you mentioned some other athletes there. Obviously, when the stakes are high in the in the pointy professional end of sport, it's just it's not work. It's just like wow, it's experimentation. It's um it's the the ultimate in terms of physical performance, you know, getting to work with some of these performers. So, but then the, you know, the, the same thread applies to the recreational athlete or the recreational performer that's out there just trying to discover what on earth is their best. And they've been rolling up year in, year out to find out what their best half marathon time is or to go from being overweight to running 10Ks. And, and that's, you know, uh, you know, Ali mentioned there that we've got his back to the end it's like anyone that walks through the doors we talk about this concept of the finish line and we're not going anywhere until we diagnose you accurately and you hear from us that we love you but you're back to your physical best and there's no more rehabilitation Mm. and so 
it's very rewarding professionally to help people and we talk around here about we're just the guides we're not the heroes of the story we're the guides that help facilitate the individuals to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve yeah and before we you know rack things up and, and head into the performance round the one question that i've got to sort of pin on both of you is what if you could give you know your younger self some advice i know i asked brad this this question on day one of me working at pogo you know i was what 18 years of age and i said to you i said what what advice would you give an 18 year old and i think he said go home and tell your mum you love her but <laughs> <laughs> and still to this day she That's you know <laughs> still to this day she you know she brings it up as being the the first thing that she remembers from brad but in terms of that what advice would you you know whether it's the the physio or the family or you know what advice would you give your younger self you know obviously you've done so well both of you up until today but you know we can all you know we can all fix on some improvements but yeah what would be that you know one vital piece <laughs> well, listen, we both just wanted yeah, each other. I've, I've just trying to buy a bit of time because I I all he has is just tell your mum you love her. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we did that every day, we'd be all small. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably have a few. Um, you know, there's no substitute for hard work, so just keep working hard. And the other thing I would tell myself now would be put yourself and throw yourself into as many uncomfortable situations as you can mm. and get comfortable in them. So whether that be doing a podcast or whether that be, you know, doing something that you're not necessarily good at or yeah. not something you know nothing about, like Brad starting the podcast or whatever it may be, if you can throw yourself into that, if I can, could have told myself, you know, when I was 18 and finished school, throw yourself into those situations, Matty, because um, you're going to come out the other side, that's what I would have done a lot more of. I think when I was that age, I hesitated, worried about, worried about what people thought of me, yeah. worried about failing and things like that. And now I'm older, I'm 28 this year, I'm like, well, stuff that. Well, yeah. You know, I wish I had thrown myself into a few more different things and and just really believed and, 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 and backed myself, man. So that, that's what I'd tell myself. I think when you, you know, you touch on about hesitating, you know, a lot of younger kids these days, you know, being in high school and everything, that's one of the big things. And, and obviously, as, as Brad mentioned a bit earlier, you know, you do take a lot of time to, you know, influence kids. And, and you know, I'd still classify myself as a big kid and you still, you know, you still, you know, strike home with some of the stuff you say. So it certainly, mm. you know, it certainly helps because it isn't until someone actually tells you it that, you yeah. actually listen to it. You know, yeah. you can spin around in your head all night long, all day long, but it's not until someone actually says you, yeah. exactly, yeah. I just think it would be, yeah, just not, yeah, not caring what people think, and I yeah. think that was something that, and I still think about it. I still worry about that now, but I'm slowly starting to just shed, shed that. And you know, if I could tell you, Matty, like just not to, I guess, worry about what what people think, and and just go out and just do what you can do and do it the best of your ability. That's that's ultimately what I would have told myself when I was 18. When you were 18, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I definitely wasn't asking questions <laughs> like that. I think you went on your way. That's, that's great awareness and Rad gave you some good advice there too. Well, I, uh, I certainly go home and tell my mum I love her most days. Uh, so I, it's good to know yeah, that, yeah, you, yeah, you know, it's obviously good. worked at some point along the way, but... No, um, and I know Brad's uh, filming a live Instagram video right now, but I'm going to throw it across to him and say, what would be your advice that you would give, you know, yourself? I'd say, I mean, there's many things you could share, but, and I think, and I like this, it's an Andy Stanley, who's one of, I guess, the voices I listen to in, in my life's journey, but experience is a good teacher, but evaluated experience is the best teacher so it's a great question Matt to reflect and go okay what have I learnt what would I share and there's many things but I think uh, one of the things is just to play to your strengths like outright don't even try and mitigate your weaknesses like do not give it a, a second of your time time's the unredeemable quality like we've only got the same amount of hours and days and um, and we spend, and I think some of it's just forged in our early childhood years and the schooling system, and you spend all this time worrying about the things that you're not good at. You know, oh my gosh, I'm getting this grade in this subject, and I, you know, people expect me to get that grade, and yet it's not of any interest to you, but you're ticking boxes, and it's this, a toil, it's an effort, it's, you know, it's a striving, it doesn't come easily. 
And then you've got other things that you just effortlessly fall into. And I look back and I realize now that, you know, those things for me were physical pursuits. Like I love them, but I love them because I had some level of ability in them. Uh, I never made a career out of professional sport, but I've sort of made a career in, in, in a different aspect of it. But, you know, I love people. I love, um, I don't know, Ali, we're kind of wired the same. And Matt, I'd put you in that category. We just love getting to know people. It's not a chore. Other people find that a chore. So I'd say play full out to your strengths and don't try and mitigate your weaknesses. Do what you need to to tick boxes to get certificates and degrees and all that stuff. And secondly, would be just to finish what you start. Um, there is such power in discipline to finish things, whether that's a warm-up set in a swim pool or a track set on the, you know, on the, in running, or whether that's a project, or whether that's a podcast, or whether that's a degree, whether that's a series. Finish what you start because the character growth comes in finishing things. And I think things have changed in the time since I left school and uh, things go faster and there's a lot more distractions. And so it's easier not to, to stick with things, but I think there's character development beyond anything in, in sticking with things until the end. And I think for, for someone who is, you know, for the viewers at home, you know, I'm, I'm 20 now. So, you know, we're moving on a couple of years from, you know, probably being at that peak of being 18, 19. These two are there looking at me because they know that, you know. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> You're 28, yeah, Ali? Yeah, yeah. You're 20. So I'm we're all about the same gap. Same gap, yeah. But as I said, I can certainly, you know, sitting here, you know, every day, I, you know, I obviously follow Ali and everything on his Instagram plus here, but and having Brad here all day, you know, every day, Monday to Friday, it's always good to, you know, just sort of get that bit of an idea that, you know, you're, you're necessarily not alone. You've got those people that are going to support you. And as I say, someone who's at my age takes that sort of advice right. on and, and takes it on the chin and, and moves on. And I, and I certainly know a lot of viewers will, uh, will get a real kick out of that. You're listening to Alistair Day Ironman champ and Matt Morby of Pogo Physio. Sit down with myself behind the microphone and explore the background to my work in, in sport and also the background to the physical performance show and where we're taking this beyond episode 100. If you missed last week's episode featuring Nathan Carnage Corbett, 11 times world Muay Thai kickboxing champion, then here's a little snippet. Every time I had a rematch or so, I always won, I'd won the first fight. So it was stepping in to fight them again and it was like, okay, was this the first time a fluke was the first time you know you got lucky or was you know do you have to now get, and they're, they're obviously that confident in themselves even though you've beat them or knocked them out to actually step back into that challenge and go I want to have another go at you to tune into the full episode and explore the archives of the physical performance show be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au or peruse the archives from your favourite podcast player let's jump back now to Matt, myself, and Ali Day. All right, so, Brad, we're going to jump into the uh, performance round. You asked these week in, week out. Um, obviously, mine is the expert edition, so I'm assuming you're ready. You've probably got these uh, these questions down, packed, memorized, so I'm expecting these uh, answers to be uh, pretty quick fire. So, first one, your bedtime. <laughs> there, there's the hesitation. It's uh, definitely new to us. Yeah. <laughs> there's been seasons where it's been consistent, and uh, you know, and there's seasons where it's all over the shop. And uh, you know, the the truthful answer is it could be anywhere in this stage of my life with two young kids and a, a fairly full schedule between 10 p.m. at its earliest and 2 a.m. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's not—I'm not proud of that. It's just the reality of my season. That'll change in time. I'm hoping. Well, you hope so, yeah. Well, what does that make the morning rise time then? Oh, I mean, anywhere from—I remember there was a season where I was just four a.m. straight a.m. four a.m. But you know, when I've gone to bed at two. You set an alarm. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you guys know what it's like. Your body just wakes you up. So you, you won't set one. I, I, these days, I am because I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah, often with the young kids, uh, and it could be anywhere from, you know, four four a.m. has happened for a little while. More like probably five thirty if I'm going exercising. Yeah, your uh, your worst injury. Worst injury, Matt, would be um, definitely that crash at 19 years of age, and it was the Australian Schoolboys Triathlon Championships, and. Um, and uh, I'd just taken the lead on the bike when I got caught up with the draft buster and um, 
took out another competitor and off I went. I was unconscious in the hospital and all that stuff followed. So that was a brain injury. Um, and that was with helmets, compulsory. You shudder to think if helmets weren't compulsory. And they were basic. That was a basic mm. headway helmet, those old headways. Yeah. And so that was, a, you know, there was fractures with that. And I didn't know at the time, but I'd split the cartilage behind my knee and that gave me grief before I ended up in surgery years later. I never thought I'd be able to run again. So to have 10 years after coming back from surgery of enjoying marathons and half marathons is something that I'm always thankful for. Yeah. Mate, I know you're into marathons now, but you can say the session you most like and disliked back then when you were doing tries. Um, or you can tailor it to, you know, you're doing marathons now. What would you say your most favourite session and then also your dis- most disliked session? I mean, uh, I'd probably go for the recent running years because it's a bit more closer to accurate memory recall than the junior triathlon years in the 90s. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I think you answered like this. I remember asking Ali this question in episode one, your favourite session. Ali said, I love them all. And you do. You, you love them all and you're thankful for the every day you get to go out and mm. you know, I know you do the same, Matt. But mm. there's nothing like finishing hard sessions. And so any time you've had to really stick with a hard session and get it done, it's very rewarding and satisfying. So I think in the running space I've done in recent years, uh, you know, there's a, a 25K midweek run I'd do in marathon preps where I'd leave where I used to live over the beach and back and do a 5K effort in the middle and feel pretty good about the day after that. So it'd be one of my favourite sessions. Most dislike session, I think it's that love-hate relationship, but track work, because you know it's going to hurt, you know it's going to sting, and you know if you're going to get the best out, you've got to put it in. And you feel great when you finish five 1K repeats with a minute recovery and you've knocked them out solidly, (laughs) uh, whatever that means for yourself. Um, But you also, at the start of it, still feel a little bit like nervous in your stomach. You're like, oh, okay, I've got to put this in now. (laughs) It's go time. So that's probably the most disliked, but also equally liked. Good answers, mate. (laughs) So favourite, mate. I'll I'll ask you, well, favourite pre-race meal, but even, let's just go, what would you eat in the morning of the marathon? I did New York a few years ago. Yeah. What about even even that or your favourite meal? I know favorite. you like sushi, mate. Uh, yeah, favourite. <laughs> I mean, pre-race meal, I know you guys have rituals that you develop and it happens over time. I've figured out that two rice crackers, and I get this asked this regularly from people tackling the marathon for the first time, two rice crackers, I have a banana, half on one bit, half on the other, sliced up and a bit of honey. And if I have that three hours before a marathon, uh, I'm set. I'll write these notes down. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you're not getting fibre in your stomach that's sloshing around. Mm. You know, the fructose is there. You've got some basic carbs and uh, a bit of sugar hit with the, the honey. What about the last time you're in the zone and describe, you know, what, what, that, what that felt like to you when you are in it? Like, you know, I know I get it quite a bit when I'm in a session and, and I often get asked, you know what it, what it feels like what does it feel like to you and can you remember the last time you were in it like just really that, that laser sharp focus and it is a great this, feeling isn't this the you know the drug yeah it's just a it's, it's why you do it it's why it's just those times where I find it's like where time stands still and there's a me- mechanical sense to your movements where I, I think the last time I was in it was probably the New York Marathon which was my last hard hit out over a marathon distance in 2015 and I underperformed on that day to my own expectation I had some dehydration issues and hypothermia at the end but I remember running through a map this is also fresh for you as you did the 2017 edition of the race <laughs> but you run through and I know it's out on Ali's to-do list we've joked together. that we like go back <laughs> together like yeah all Ali three of us yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all go back and, uh, you know, running through one of the burrows and there's just thousands of people and it was about the 35K mark and normally I'd start to be feeling it. I just felt the last 5Ks, I had a bit of zest. And so, you know, you just you feel like you're not even in your body. I know one of the guests recently, it's yet to be aired, but Lee Troop said he feels like he's running over the ground. It might have been Ben St. Lawrence, sorry. He said he's running over the ground rather than on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then prior to that, you know, I remember the Melbourne Marathon. It's just amazing how your mind can get so myopic onto the, the movement. I remember running and uh, we were going up a slight hill in the Botanical Gardens and a guy rode up to a runner that was running next to me and he's on his bike and he said to him, Andrew, you're doing great. You're nearly at the top of the hill. And I remember thinking to myself, are we running up a hill? <laughs> like if that's how much you just, you know, you can yeah. get into that zone. It's, it's a fantastic feeling. What about, what about a time when you just you've bonked like you, you know in, the, in those marathon days even in your triathlon days I've, I've had a few times when I've been out 
I've had the big days of training in the summer. Um, I remember one story, me and Josh Minogue actually were paddling, doing a paddle back from Coolum one afternoon. It was blowing a nor'east, blowing a nor'east, and we got to Oldman Island, which is about seven, or maybe, yeah, seven k's from the surf club where Michael King, my coach, was waiting for us. And I remember getting there and seeing it in the distance <laughs> going, I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I remember it took me, I just bonked. I completely just... You know, I remember going to the service station on the way home and drinking two litres of chocolate milk and, you know, Smith, I sat there in the car and I had to wait, wait for my blood sugar levels to go back up. <laughs> Have you had, ever had a story like that or where you've had a flat tyre and stuck somewhere? It's not the most pleasant feeling, but you get a good story out of it and I think you need to have those days as, as an athlete. Surely you must have had. Oh, heaps, but you never forget them, do you? No. <laughs> I think the earliest recollection has been out in the bike ride in Grafton in Junction Hill uh, and being underfueled over maybe a two-hour bike ride at 14, 15 and uh, being, this is in the days where mobile phones were big bricks and I thought it was cool to have a mobile phone when it went for a ride. My parents wanted me to have it for safety, but that was in the days you didn't turn them on unless you had to make a call. <laughs> and it was an old Nokia. So <laughs> sat in my middle pocket. 10, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I had to call my dad and I'm like, I'm you know, 30 k's out of town near Cottonhurst and I've got no cash and, and I've, I can't <laughs> ride another pedal stroke. Can you come and get me? So he drove out in the truck and picked me up. Um, and that used to happen all the time as a kid. I remember going home from school gorging on a big plate of chips. I hadn't yet figured out the nutrition thing, which watching a bit of TV and then riding my bike down to the local track and then wondering why after eating Doritos or whatever I was I didn't feel like I could pull off the track session being lightheaded and dizzy <laughs> and so you know I was bonking all the time as a kid and you got your growing you know your demands of your growth which yeah. adds another tax in more recent years um you know um you feel like the power plugs just pulled out on you and you just you just you know, I remember doing it out of the box training session with after I got back into triathlon but in the 30 to 34 year age bracket after 12 years out of the sport and I was doing what we call the three peaks ride here on the Gold Coast which is about 3,000 metres of elevation gain you ride up Tomowin which is a decent climb here on the Gold Coast the front side then you descend it then you ride out and go up Springbrook and you drop down that and then you go out Jeez. to Beachmont and I was having a bit of a internal conversation with Tour de France style climbing you know, <laughs> Phil Liggett commentating my ride and I had the two other guys and they're like giving me some kudos about my climbing ability and I'm just thinking I've got it all together and I'm dropping these guys going up Beachmont and it was one of the biggest bonks I've had and I got near the top of Beachmont and just completely lost it and uh, Richard and um, and Chris, the two guys I was riding with, uh, just came steaming past and they didn't give me any love as they just dropped me like a bad habit and then I think I had to ride the next 3Ks up the mountain and got to the, got to the Beachmont shop and just sat there like what'd you get? I made everything coke I would normally <laughs> drink soft drink but coke and chocolate yeah. uh, snakes so yeah, well, you know yeah. And that, you feel it, it's like your blood starts singing. It's, uh, the scariest thing is when you know it's coming on, you're like, I can't stop this. Your mouth starts watering, you start getting all excited. You, yeah. you know what, actually, they have this theory about peak performance. It's uh, the central governor theory, which is if you're pushing yourself for long enough or hard enough without the right fuel, your brain does start to centrally govern, your, your body starts to centrally govern itself. So it starts stripping blood away from the, the necessary, the unnecessary functions of your body to the necessary things in this case the working musculature mm. so you are losing the ability to concentrate which is why you just running up the hill i had no idea we're going up the hill mm. my body said you, you don't need your brain to be thinking cognitively at the moment mm. you know we just need you to be turning your legs over so it's amazing how i mean you know you guys probably had the eyes the eyes start to close your vision closes yeah. up and you feel like your world gets really small and, uh, and you know what we sit here and we laugh about it but we secretly all love it <laughs> oh of course of course I'd love to know the, the things that Lionel goes through on a daily basis and all those guys that you know all those 100, 100 people that have been on the podcast particularly those Iron, Ironman marathon runners uh, man, what they go through <laughs> I guess that's why we want to do Kona. We want to know what that feeling's like. So, what was that? Ali Day wants to do Kona. Yeah, <laughs> you've you've heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, you know. to teach me to ride a bike. So. <laughs> Sport exclusive. I've only got the fix, you, got the fix you, home. Um, Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Brad's, going, Brad's going over the New York Marathon for his 40th. I might do Kona for my 40th. So. Come on. you got, what, 12, 12, 12 years? years yeah, exactly. Years. Who knows what can happen in 12 years? But to wrap it all up, Brad. 
what is your greatest fear? Definitely uh, not living up to my potential. And whether that's, you know, in my professional life, um, as, a, as a parent, um, as someone in the community, you know, all the aspects that we all wear, all our different hats, it would be not living up to your own potential. And so your full potential. And that's, that just comes up regularly with the guests when we ask them, you know, what scares you? And it's often, you know, not discovering their full potential. And the reality is we all go to the grave with more there is always more mm. but um, it's tapping into how much of that yeah. without putting a strain and a striving on it but letting life's rhythms take you there yeah definitely well, that's certainly uh, a good way to put it as Ali said you, you know there's no rock overturned or uh, there's something along those lines I think it was a few hours ago you said that so that's I that's probably uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's probably that's, uh, there we go that's the one but um, no that's certainly some good you know, advice and obviously, you know, you've hit the nail on the head with those performance around it. You've been doing them for what, two years? So I'd, uh, I'd like to think well, you know. I don't think I got on. Oh, that's why I was a bit dirty. I didn't, I don't know, I haven't listened to mine in a while. I don't know <laughs> if I got the performance round. There was no, did, did we? The performance round, I think, came in around. Yeah, so that's, that's, maybe, that's why I'm waiting for. Like, You're waiting for your call back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't too late, I'd, I'd ask Brad to ask me the performance rounds. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, we're pushing on 12.30, we'd be, uh, we'd be going all night. Okay, mate, best recovery tip? Get off your legs. So put them up on a couch, up the wall. I mean, I remember reading Tyler Hamilton's book, um, and I was actually at the World 2012 Age Group Triathlon Champs in Auckland. And I was getting ready for my 30 to 34 age group race and I wasn't at the practice so I could get off my legs and I sat around and I don't think I've ever had a day where I've done so little but I just sat in bed read the Tyler Hamilton book um, and come the race day I felt fantastic and on the flip side I remember going to the Melbourne Marathon walking around all day all over Melbourne the day before with a backpack on my back (laughs) off the airport you name it everything wrong and feeling a bit tired come the Melbourne Marathon so get off your legs yeah is there a mantra you use when you were racing slash competing yeah as a junior I didn't have it together well I used to make myself so nervous that I'd almost vomit at the start of a start line and that was feeling the pressures of that weren't there feeling like I had to please my parents that they'd invested money to take me to a triathlon you know interstate or whatever it might be and that uh there was a financial commitment from them and I wanted to do that process do justice and I beat myself up as a junior the whole time to the point that I didn't even enjoy racing and then I just flipped the switch where it was like I'm ready I'm here I've done the best I can I'm going to focus on me and I had to go through those uncomfortable years as an athlete and so I think you know um, as an example you know uh, you know I, I've shared this with Ali actually and that is at the world tri champs which for me was just a personal bucket list as an athlete, I never got to a world champs as a kid from 19, I was out of it. Um, but to go back at 30 to 34 and, and have a crack in my age group, which was pretty cool. And I, I had on my, it was so windy in Auckland that day that people felt like they were gonna get blown off the bike course. And I had this, <laughs> this uh, scripture on my headset written out there, which was, uh, I'm safe and set on high. And as I'm riding around, I'm just, you know, that was just in my head and I'm like, I'm safe, I'm set on high, off we go. And I had the best race of my life. It's cool. Yeah, definitely. Cool, cool mantra, man. Yeah. Who's the athlete you most admire and why? That's a tough one. Well, right now it's 12.30 a.m. It's a Monday night and Ali Day's got to get up in the morning and do a hey, session. Uh, I've just paid Brad to I'll just Brad for that. And answer. so my respect levels have gone to a whole other level. And I know, you, uh, I know you, you watch so many different sports. You have so many different athletes in here. It'd have to be Brad Bev, Brad Bev, wouldn't it? Well, it's, 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 you know, it's like who's your favourite child? It's, it's, it's a great question and I know, you know, deserves an answer. But you, re- you know, I admire people that walk into the physio room that go from not having run in their life to running a, a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon. So, you know, to answer the question, the athlete I most admire um, might seem might seem close to home and quite bizarre that you would ask the question, Ali, mm. but I think you'll appreciate the answer. And that is because I've had the proximity to this athlete over the better part of 10 years, and it would actually be Shannon Eckstein Mm. for the fact that, you know, he works in the same space you do. Um, He has never had a scandal in 
15, 20 years at the top of sport, Ever. which how often does that happen these days? Um, his performance has spoken for itself. Uh, he's ridden as every athlete does the highs and the lows. He's a great ambassador for his sport. Um, and so to have sort of worked with someone for so long, I really admire um, the way he goes about it humbly and just gets the job done. So that's, that's just true. because it's been such a proximity thing. Um, but, you know, I admire so many athletes. Mm. It's a hard one to... It's a really tough one to answer. But Ellie was hoping he would come out and say, you know, Ellie Day, but, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> I've got, I've got a lot more to do. Well, I started with the kudos at a soft thing, and Ellie's yeah. still here with his eyes open. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what's one bit of training advice you would give to listeners about how to perform at their physical best? <laughs> is that a hard question to ask it's you? It's so hard, isn't it? Now, now I feel, now I understand how the guests feel. And that would be just to show up, you know, yeah. just to show up when you're tired, when you don't feel like it, when it's cold, when it's hot, when it's rainy, when it's, you know, windy, when you don't feel like you're into it, you're not feeling the love, just show up. And I always say the magic happens when you just show up. Mm-hmm. And whether that's sitting us here at 12.30 a.m. finishing this <laughs> podcast, we're showing up, or whether that's, um, you know, rocking up at a session. Because, you know, we all know, we both, we all know the three of us, if you get there... It's half the battle. The rest just takes care of itself. So just yeah. show up. The the one that I do want to add, Ali and I have sort of been pointing at ones we want to we want to throw on. But this is one I look forward to most weeks, and it sort of says something about you know the listeners or you know as who we're interviewing. But if you could have dinner with three people, living or past, I know he's laughing right now because he he throws this one on. I think Definitely on. Would be you on it, man. Yeah, exactly. Well, look, it could be us. Well, this three. is about <laughs> But who would it be and why? And as I say, I know it's probably hard to throw that on you, but it's always good to know. And I know the guests often go, oh, gosh, with this one, and now I'm feeling that old gosh moment too because <laughs> yeah. you feel a some burden to make sure it's a good answer. But it changes all the time, right? But it would change. But, oh, I mean, you'd have to have historical figures in there and, you know, contemporary figures. I mean, leaving aside, and I love when people have mentioned this from the guests, leaving aside the obvious ones, your loved ones, your family, your kids, mm. your wife, and, you know, all that stuff, your parents, um, to answer the purity of the question like a, a guest... Um, I could guess one. I think. Okay, you guess one. <laughs> Help me out. Be, one, would, one would have to be Anthony Kiedis. <laughs> well, yeah, Anthony <laughs> Kiedis for the Chili Peppers. <laughs> yeah, uh, would be. Let's let's chuck him on the table for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, I did have a uh, a long standing infatuation with the Chili Peppers growing up, and right now, if uh, I got invited to do some physio work for the Chili Peppers, I would drop everything and be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> Um, so let's put Anthony Kiedis at the table. Good pick up, Ali. Um, gosh. Uh, I mean, I just think cause he's such a transcendent figure in modern society and he's just like, seems like a lot of fun. Richard Branson. I mean, yeah, the guy's okay. just, you know, wow, like, mm. just lives large and it's not his wealth, it's just his spirit and how he goes about it. So we've got Richard Branson and Anthony Kiedis and... Um, Now he knows, what the now he knows yeah. exactly. Yeah, twelve thirty. Um, the third one would be, you know, how could you not put in at the table, Jesus, <laughs> two thousand years, and you know, there's he, he walked the earth two thousand years ago, and he has an impact unlike any other person in mm. history. Exactly. Time has split around his. His very life and death. There's AD and BC, and so I'd want to hear from himself. Yeah. And Anthony Kiedis could probably get a bit out of him, and I reckon so could Richard, <laughs> Richard Branson. Branson. <laughs> <laughs> that would, very, very that would I, I, I'd love to be the waiter at that night, just you know, delivering the drinks. Well, the what bread and the wine would be taken care of. <laughs> oh, there you go. What about mate? Tell more. What's on the bucket list for Brad Beer? Oh, Ali. I mean, we've got great vision for pogo physio um you know the original vision for a practice was to have a national impact to deliver services so well that people sought them out specifically and desired them so 
Um, I'd love to see, and it's different to the 20s when it was probably more about the ego. I'm in my mid to late 30s now and it's more about the impact. And so I'd love to see in the coming years Pogo make its way into other sort of metro hubs and and further from that. So I'd love to see all the unique things we do as a practice, this finish line concept lived, lived out in other practices. So Australian physio consumers... And people who resonate with performing at their best can get to their physio finish line. So I'd love to see our practice do the journey over the decade, decades to come. Uh, Personally, I want to be a great dad and, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than putting your get girls to bed. And I ask Bella, hey, darling, what do you want for your birthday? And she rolls over and says... I just want your love, Daddy. (laughs) And so, you know, I want to keep being a a dad that encourages my kids and just makes the most of every moment. Obviously, uh, you know, husband to Christina and trying to encourage her on her journey. Um, And then professionally, there's a bunch of goals as well, like there's more books I want to write. Um, uh, I'd love to be... I'd love to achieve some more sporting goals, running PBs in the marathon. Uh, I do think I'd like to do Kona at some point. Um, I'd like to share the experience, so, you know, maybe it's with you gents in some way. But um, So there's so many things. I think that's the joy of life is there's so much to do and we, I guess we get a sense of there's so little time. Yeah. And the, uh, the last one we're going to finish on is just because this is something you do week in, week out with all guests and I know it's going to be, uh, your brain's probably going to be clicking over here trying to think of something, but... We want you to issue a physical challenge to the listeners, you know, something that you want them to go out and achieve this week. What would it be? Yeah, and thanks, Matt and Ali. It would be let's make something that's achievable but challenging enough. And I'm going to say if in one week listeners can do, and it's something that everyone's probably tried at some point and it gets done well and other times not as well, but with good form, a front plank. Let's just go for a good old plank and do it the moment you hear this episode and then do it seven days later but practice it in the meantime and the net difference needs to be a gain of uh, at least 45 seconds so the plank challenge improving your performance by 45 seconds in the space of seven days the point being how quickly the body can adapt to a stimulus you get incredible change in as little as seven to 14 days definitely yeah well uh, i know i'll be uh, taking part and i know uh, i reckon ellie i'll throw him under the bus here and Listen, say you I'm can get a you'll be talking about <laughs> in uh, 45 seconds to a two-hour plank <laughs> well, yeah, i think it's actually on my track actually you know, it's, <laughs> it's got me doing it with swiss balls and weights and things like that so um i'll definitely have a crack at it for sure yeah i think we uh, will all give it a crack no matter what time of the day it is. <laughs> yeah, well, game on. So there you have it. Episode 100 of the Physical Performance Show. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully you took a little bit away from it. If you did enjoy it, then as always, I am very much interested in receiving feedback on how we can make this show better. So please let myself know via email b.beer at pogophysio.com.au or jump on social media at brad underscore beer and feel free to tag myself in and also Matt Morby and Alastair Day whose handles will be featured on the show notes over at pogophysio.com.au. If you enjoyed today's episode and know someone who would benefit or enjoy it, then please consider sharing it with them. That helps the show get into the earbuds of more people who just like you are looking to perform at their physical best. Don't forget also to hit subscribe from within your favorite podcast player to get each episode live in your earbuds every week. When we launched the first episode with Ali Day way back in March 2016, I knew that reviews and ratings in iTunes were important. And if we fast forwarded, I wouldn't have anticipated that we would have had somewhere in the vicinity of 160 plus five-star reviews for the show. So if you are one of those listeners who has left a review to date, I want to say a huge, huge thank you. Certainly the reviews are one of the reasons, as well as the download numbers that have helped the physical performance show regularly be featured inside the top 50 for health and fitness, quite often inside the top 20 and on occasions even well inside the top 10. So thank you very much. Really, the reviews have been great fuel and motivation for me to and the team to continue bringing this 
to you each and every week. So thank you very much. I want to say a big thanks this week to one of the show listeners who has taken the time to leave a review, and that is Tism Fan. Tism Fan rated the Physical Performance Show five stars and commented, love the podcast and so annoyed that I've had your book for two years but didn't know about this until recently. The athletes are clearly comfortable with Brad as there is minimal input required for him to get their story out. Tism, thanks so much for your review. Thanks also for tuning in and apologies that you didn't know that uh, this podcast went live for almost two years. So I hope you're enjoying some of the archives and certainly the upcoming revised edition of You Can Run Pain-Free will point people to download episodes that grab their interest. So thanks very much for your feedback and for your review. And if you'd like to leave a review, it is it has never been easier. We can now do it via our smartphones inside the iTunes app, and that's simply through hitting ratings and review and rate away, one star or five stars. Thanks in advance. Big thank you to the faithful team who from the outset have bought the physical performance show to you. That is Daryl Misson, our ever-consistent incredible audio engineer Daz a massive thank you you believed in this project uh, from our first conversation when I shared the idea with you and you've been a great source of encouragement also virtual assistant assistant to the show Susan Wilkin who has been an incredible support proactively behind the scenes from the get-go had a period where Sophie Walker contributed for several months before Susan Wilkin took the reins back in that capacity so thank you both Susan and Sophie for your contribution and also our ever talented graphic artist Matt Olding who from episode one has outputted the quotes which we all love and also the featured guest tiles so thank you very much team for helping behind the scenes thanks also to our recently appointed show sponsor normatech recovery who make this show possible and also of course pogo physio podcasts are free to download however they are not free to produce and the support of normatech recovery and pogo physio helps this show go live each and every week A recently added bit of fun we've been having here with the Physical Performance Show is the Podsy competition. If you're enjoying an episode, take a screenshot of your phone and share it on social media. Tag myself in at Brad underscore beer and go into the draw for the week to win a copy, a signed copy of You Can Run Pain Free, my running and jogging bestseller. If you'd like to purchase a copy of my running and jogging bestseller, You Can Run Pain Free, then apply a promo code, and that is POD2018, lowercase, to receive 50% off the recommended retail price of $24.95. And you can do that over at Pogo Physio. Dot com.au. If you're outside of Australia, you can order a copy of You Can Run Pain Free over on Amazon or, of course, devour the Audible editions, the audio editions available from Audible or iBooks. Coming up in next week's episode, episode 101, 101, I catch up with Australian distance running legend Lee Troop. Lee has been a three times Olympic marathoner for Australia and was the former 5,000 metre Australian record holder. It's quite a moving episode with Lee at the end of the show. Lee touches on a tragedy that has bef- that befell his Boulder Track Club teammates really on only a few days prior to us recording the episode. So Lee touches on that at the end of our time together. Before that, we cover the highs, the lows, and the learnings from Lee's remarkable career. He really opens the door on some insights from Sydney 2000 and, in his words, his disappointment from that and also the great successes he had and the frustrations he had around trying to get his best performance out at an Olympic marathon. It's a great episode. You are going to love that next week. So until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been episode 100 of the Physical Performance Show. Mm -hmm.